Hello, welcome to The Market Carver. I'm Adam Harder, Chief Investment Officer, along with Andrew Thrasher, Chartered Market Technician and Portfolio Manager. Uh, thank you, as always, for joining us and giving us a few minutes of your time. We, we do certainly uh, value that and appreciate uh, the time that you do give us. Uh, so we want to uh, respond to that with some data and information that we find uh, relevant. Uh, so the three things that we have to share with you this week, we're going to talk about bond spreads and them continuing to decline and what that means. Take a look at mortgage rates, certainly in focus after uh, the beginning of some Fed rate cuts, and then the dominance that we've seen of the U.S. dollar, an right? ever-present question uh, that we see through the years. So uh, let's start right in with uh, the bond uh, decline that we've seen in spreads. Uh, we're going to throw up a chart here. Now, some uh, charts are more important. Some data is more important than others in finance. And I would put this closer to the top of the list, uh, specifically when you see a difference in the way uh, that the fixed income markets are responding from equities or, or vice versa uh, and how those are, are interacting. So what we're looking at here, the top panel, of course, is the S&P 500. And below, we're looking at a couple different categories of bonds. One would be your lower quality or higher yield. And then the bottom one would be your safest of the safe, the triple A bonds. And what we're measuring is how much additional interest are those bond investors requiring uh, to make those investments. Of course, it would be a little bit more for the high yield uh, and a little than, than it would be for the triple A. And both of those are relative to what uh, U.S. Treasury investors are requiring. And notice that that line changes through times and times of distress that begins to rise. Investors require more and more interest uh, for taking on the risk of that investment. So what we're seeing here uh, is not what we were seeing in 2022. We are seeing uh, those spreads staying very strong and healthy and in cont actually continuing to improve, meaning they're getting smaller and smaller, meaning investors uh, are comfortable taking on more and more risk in this category. Now, you can really see where this is interesting. Go back and you can see the blue dotted lines uh, back in the middle of 2022, looking in those summer months. And while the equity markets at S&P 500 was continuing to uh, deteriorate and, and look poor over the summer, bond spreads were actually beginning to improve. And in some ways, we would argue beginning to sow uh, the seeds of what could be some good recovery down the road. Uh, they're not always uh, correlated perfectly through time. Uh, but when you see that difference, it's certainly worth paying attention to. And it's noteworthy that right now we are not seeing that opposite dynamic. The market looks healthy from an equity perspective and fixed income investors are responding the same. So uh, as that changes, we would certainly come back and inform you when we see it moving the other way. Uh, but for now, those are both moving in the right direction. Uh, sticking with, with bonds here, but staying with mortgage rates. Uh, and we're going to throw up a chart here. Yeah. So what we're looking at uh, the blue line is the effective or excuse me, is the actual 30 rate, 30 year fixed rate mortgage. So what is the current rate uh, for mortgages? Of course, we spiked after 2022, after we went through a series of rate hikes. And those have been coming down uh, actually over the past several months, well before uh, the Fed actually cut rates uh, just last uh, September. Uh, but notice the gold line, and this is really an interesting marker for where we are right now, uh, and that is the effective mortgage rate. And there's such a big disparity because of how many homeowners were able to lock in and fix their mortgage, but interest rates were so low. Uh, so on one hand, uh, we actually saw that strong increase in mortgage rates, but it didn't have the same traditional effect uh, of being uh, impairing consumer spending in other, in other ways. Uh, because most of these uh, mortgages, a broad majority of mortgages, were already locked in and, and were impacted. Uh, and now to the other flip side of that is we don't expect a gigantic recovery, a gigantic move in the housing market, uh, again, because most <laughs> mortgages remain unaffected. So on the margins, sure, uh, we've seen some people maybe coming off the sidelines. Uh, but for the most part, this isn't as impactful as we've seen in other cycles. Uh, so those are those two. I'm going to pass it over to Andrew to talk about the U.S. dollar. Thank you, Adam. So one question we consistently get year after year, and it's something that we often see in the headlines as well, is what's going on with the dollar? Is there any type of risk to the dollar collapse? We know it's a very popular headline about either Brazil, Russia, and Saudi Arabia combining together, joining forces to come after the dominance of the dollar. What's going on with Europe? 
what about our national debt? Is our national debt going to going to have a negative impact on the dollar? And so this is a question we consistently get, and we always want to provide new and updated information when we get maybe unique angles or different ways to look at why we continue to believe that the major threats to the dollar aren't maybe as major as the, the headlines may perceive. And so I have two different pieces of charts or kind of tables that I want to look at. The first one on the far left looks at the amount of shares of global currency reserves. So how much uh, reserves are being held in different currencies? And you see this goes back over 20 years. That top line, there's our U.S. dollar. And then we have the, the euro and orange and then a lot of other major currencies far below, well under 10 percent there. But notice that over the last 20 years, the dollar has slightly declined, going from just over 70 percent to just over 60 percent. That's over a 20-year time period, very much still the dominant player, whereas the second highest uh, global reserve currency, the euro, is sitting right at 20 percent. So right now, with in the near term, we don't see anything really threatening the U.S. dollar. Uh, we're not seeing, we discussed in the past, transactions that are at record high being done in the U.S. dollar, global reserve currency still primarily being held in U.S. dollars. And now we want to shift to the table. What could actually, what kind of play devil's advocate here, what could cause a, a shift to where the dollar no longer is the dominant currency, the major reserve currency in the world? And what we can do is look at the previous times where there has been a shift from one currency to another. In fact, there's only been a handful of them since really the 16th century. You can see when the, the Spanish dollar took over in the 16th century was after Spanish Armada defeated the English Navy. Then we saw the pound in the 18, 1815 to 1920 after the Napoleonic Wars, and then also different innovative catalysts, the steamship industry, mining transportation. And then we fast forward to the 1920s. We had World War II, World War, I'm sorry, World War I, World War II, and the adoption of the Federal Reserve System, the telegraph, and different aviation technologies. And so what this, this is showing is that it's not so much that other currencies begin to take, let's say, market share from the dominant currency. It's really been either major conflict or innovation catalysts that have sparked a shift from one dominant currency to another. And right now we're just not we're not seeing necessarily a dominant um, knock on wood, a dominant uh, major catalyst like a war, like we've seen in the past. The only real innovative threat that's on the, the horizon right now possibly could be cryptocurrency, but it's still so much in an infancy and its usage is so small, it hasn't nearly gotten to the level to where it could really be realistic replacement as a reserve currency or, or major global trade um, like we see the U.S. dollar being used for. And so that's what we think when we start looking at what could be those catalysts, we need to really less focus on other currencies and the, the the usage of those and more so about innovation and then major views as far as major wars and things like that um, that thankfully don't happen very often. As you can see, just a handful of times since the 16th century have we seen a change of hands for what currency really has been the dominant reserve, uh, reserve player across the world. Um, so that's why we continue to believe we don't see a major threat in the short term, intermediate term to the U.S. dollar dominance. Now we start looking longer term. We don't know what uh, type of new innovations could be on the purview of crypto could continue to evolve and uh, take up some more attention. Um, but right now, we still firmly believe the U.S. dollar uh, is, is here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you for putting that out there. And, you know, coming off the third lease, that was a question and at least one or two of them. So I know that it stays out there. And I think mainly because for, for whatever reason, it's such an easy target for those that sell newsletters. Uh, <laughs> and it, it is still an item that can be used to stoke fear and create some concern that can then in turn sell something, which usually turns out to be a newsletter or something of that variety. So just be aware of you always want to look at what the source is of those concerns. So again, thank you as always. Really do appreciate you uh, jumping on here, giving us a few minutes of your time. As always, if we can be of help, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call, 800-928-4001, or scan the QR code and book it electronically. Uh, thanks again and have a great weekend.